everyone, it's Danielle with North Lawn Flower Farm. Well, I want to welcome you all to the May Garden Tour and thank you so much for choosing to spend some time with me here in my garden today. Just in case you're new to the channel, I just wanted to give you a really short backstory on my property, where I'm located and kind of what my growing situation is. So I'm growing here in Southern Pennsylvania on a little bit more than half of an acre. I've been growing cut flowers on this property for seven years and selling them at our farm stand. And I'm really kind of transitioning from growing cut flowers in rows, which is the only way I grew cut flowers early on, to creating garden borders everywhere that function as cut flower gardens that are still as productive as those rows that are more traditional in cut flower production. Now my garden is always a work in progress. I'm always learning and growing new things. And for me, the joy is really in the journey and not really too much about the end result. But today I'll show you all my gardens. I'm gonna show you the main flower walk, the hydrangea room, my $5 garden, the driveway garden, which someone said maybe we should call that the avenue, and also the raised beds and some other areas that I tend to not show. A lot of people are asking about the trees on the properties, the fruit trees, so I'm really going to try to share it all in today's garden tour. And I'll also really put a lot of plant names in the description section because I've seen that requested also. So let's start here in the main flower walk. And I think it's really all about the alliums and a few peonies as we go through the main flower walk in late May. I did cut the majority of the peonies this year, but I tried to leave a few here and there to enjoy in the garden. So as you first pull into the property, you can see my car here. This is the first parking spot. Now I have to do a close up on this gorgeous tiny wine nine bark because doesn't it look just beautiful spilling over the fence here? This is my favorite time of year for this nine bark. I just think it brings so much magic and maturity into the garden. Even though this garden is only six, seven years old, it's just nice to have some shrubs that are kind of spilling over. It's a beautiful morning. And let me turn this this way first so you can see I've actually kept the chairs here after that baby shower we had and I'm really, really enjoying sitting here. And I have kind of a mix of flowering bulbs behind us. So I have some lilies you can see coming up there. I'm doing an experiment where I'm trying to put the mahogany splendor hibiscus more as a mid-height ground cover. So I plan to be cutting on that and kind of keep it at about three feet tall and we'll see how that goes. So back here we did have daffodils, but now we have these gorgeous alliums here. And I will try to put names on the screen this time, guys. But aren't these just so fun? And there's so many cool varieties of alliums to grow. And I'm just learning about more and more. And it's just so fun to add more each year. And then we have some verbena there. That's the perennial verbena. So if I turn this slowly, hopefully you can see that some of those foxglove are starting to elongate and put on their bloom stalks. I planted those really early on in the season and I anticipate them blooming probably in about a week. A beautiful hedge of catmint, but let me show you kind of what I see when I sit in my chair here every morning. This is kind of the vista that we see. So let's take a look at all these alliums. I had mentioned previously that I wasn't too sure about Pinball Wizard, but it's actually getting bigger and bigger as the days go on. And now I just feel like it's absolutely magical and I want to add more into the garden everywhere I can along the main flower walk. And I have multiple layers going on in most areas. I have the alliums there, more uh, salvia, some sunflowers that will pop up and fill in, and also some gladiolas in there. So let's travel down the main flower walk together, but check out this awesome service berry. Don't you just love a service berry tree? This has to be the best tree ever. Would you agree? If you've never had a service berry before, and I hadn't until a few years ago, they're delightful and delicious. They taste just like blueberries. So moving down from the service berry, we'll just travel down the main flower walk together, and I'll try to talk about what's on either side of the border. So we have more catmint and bactesia there. And what's mixed into this border, because this border over here is kind of interesting. 
it really only gets sun from about 3 p.m. till sundown. So a lot of things in the back can actually take full shade. And guess what else I'm dealing with over here is bindweed. So send me all your organic advice on bindweed. I'm just pulling it. Once again, it was one of those things where it wasn't a big problem last year, but this year I'm out here pulling it every single day. It seems to grow, you know, multiple feet every day. It's so crazy. But on a positive note, check out this awesome lime smoke bush. Isn't that gorgeous? I love the color and I just love the shape of the leaves. And everything is just so fresh and beautiful in May, isn't it? I have some anemones sprinkled throughout the garden this year. And I have a confession. I think I'm on the anemone train and possibly off the ranunculus train. The ranunculus are looking great and I'll show you them very shortly here, but I don't know why the anemones are doing it for me this year, but they certainly are. So hopefully you can just see back in there a few different layers, some Festiva maxima peonies, some evergreens, bearded iris going over, and we have a lot of lilies to look forward to on this side. And then on the other side of the border is some star flower that I direct seeded. I had mentioned that the direct seeded star flower looks exactly the same as the ones I started inside. And actually, I think they're even stronger plants when I really look at them. And what I've done in here is to try to disguise this daffodil foliage with the star flower, but also I put in a lot of the dahlias that I grew from seed. I sprinkled in everywhere throughout the garden, really hoping for a nicer um, September flower show in the main flower walk. So we'll see how that goes. Check out this allium, guys. This one is called Ambassador. It's really tall, but the bloom heads aren't huge, but they're super fun and the uh, florets seem really packed in, don't they? So we'll see if these kind of expand out and get bigger and bigger as time goes on. But I love these two. I would love to add some more of these next year. I think my bulb order this year is gonna be heavy on alliums and daffodils and a little bit lighter on the tulips. Sorry, the sun's coming up now, so you see in my shadow there. But we have here a lemony lace elderberry, which I actually cut that one back down to the ground because it wasn't looking that great, and it flushed up beautiful new growth. So I'll keep that around as long as it's looking good. And here's some more pinball wizard alliums. These ones aren't quite as big yet. The bees are really, really loving all the alliums. I decided to remove all of the lower branches from my Vitex this year, and I'm liking that so far. It's kind of springing back lower branches faster than I can prune them out, but I was hoping to go for more of an open look here and almost the look of a crepe myrtle. So we'll see how that goes. So let's go down here a little bit more and then I'll backtrack. So my first sunflower succession, I don't think I've showed you where it's located at, so let me show you that now. So here we just have some perennial salvias. This really cool um, foliage here is rue. I just put that in last year and this is the first time I'm seeing it flowering. I believe it's supposed to get a yellow flower there. Really great foliage texture for arrangements. This is all that Dara that we planted. Oh, sorry, not Dara. This is all the Ami Magus that we planted together. And then if you can start to see some sunflowers there and look at the catbird guys. Isn't he awesome? Um, all these sunflowers here, and also back behind that lemony lace elderberry there along the fence line, that's my first sunflower succession of the Pro Cut Plum. Sorry I haven't showed you that before. You see all these lilies here? I think we're gonna go ahead and sell these and then replace them with something else because they're kind of a really strong uh, burgundy color, and I think I wanna swap it out for maybe a pink. Now, what in the world is going on here, guys? <laughs> <laughs> Did I plant this one random allium directly in front of the bird bath? I don't know, maybe, maybe I hadn't had enough coffee that day, but I can't even figure out what kind of allium it is. It doesn't look like any of the other ones I grew and I buy them, you know, in bags of five, 10, 15. So I don't know what's going on here. I actually thought I planted some more Schubertii alliums right here. There's no Schubertii 
and this guy is just standing here doing his own thing. Anyway, I think he's kind of fun and funky. I'm going to leave him. So I think I better turn us around so we don't miss anything. Let me backtrack here. So that's where we were. And now on this side, I want to show you, this is some spider work from my grandma's garden and also a Japanese maple that my grandfather gave me that was kind of buried underneath that burning bush for forever. Not really doing much at all and always just getting smothered by other plants. So I moved it over here. Here is an allium that is looking really interesting. Let me know what you think about it. It's called Sicilian honey garlic. And look how it's kind of just hanging on to its paper sheath there. <laughs> Apparently the bees are supposed to love it. I'm not sure if it's normal for it to kind of lean over like this and have a really kind of um, flimsy bloom stock, but they all kind of did that, but possibly Grace kind of ran through them. I'm not sure. But once again, have some dahlias tucked in here, have the amimagus, and then I came down here with a variegated sage to hopefully fill in this area with some more lime color, that's a perennial. And also I have some rocket white um, snapdragons tucked in there. It's just a great morning. I hope you guys are all having a great day. We're passing by a limelight hydrangea right now. Here I have my espresso gladiolas, if you remember those from last year, that's where those are located. Here's the um, Festiva Maxima peony that I dug up and divided in a video, and it's coming back. Oh, look, bindweed. So here's what it looks like. And it just winds around everything. See it there? This is my worst enemy right now in the garden. Do you have a worst enemy weed in the garden? Anyway, I'm gonna set that right in the middle of the pathway so I throw it in the garbage. I don't even compost that. So down here I have some ladies mantle, more bearded iris, and here's the Siberian iris from my grandma's garden in bloom. The irises came and went really, really quickly this year. We had uh, just like two days where it didn't rain all day, but it rained really hard and quickly kind of just took out a lot of things. Lambs here also from my grandma's garden there and some more dahlias tucked in. So I think we're back to where we left off on the other side now. The uh, most popular question I get is what is this evergreen? This is a Japanese cedar and I never feel like the camera does it justice. I think it's the most beautiful plant, such a wonderful evergreen, beautiful cones insanely fast growing. You know how they say arborvitae is a fast growing evergreen? It doesn't even hold a candle <laughs> to this Japanese cedar. I think some of them get really, really big. So that's something to take into consideration. I want to show you this because even though the blooms are gone, I think what it leaves behind looks so cool. It looks almost like coral and I like to cut it and use it in arrangements. It's just Dame's Rocket. Um, I got this from our real estate agent when we moved here. She gave me some of this from her garden, but just kind of a fun textural element there. More anemones down here. Some bleeding heart. I still need to move that bee bomb that always floats over here from my neighbor's garden. It just tends to get powdery mildew real bad. And then here we are at kind of where the garden opens up a bit. And I'm gonna take you on the path that I take every morning, which is just kind of straight and all around and back through the hydrangea room. But let me show you what it looks like from this direction. The Orlea is in full bloom now. And I love it, I think it looks great. And I had no plans to put Orlea on either side. There's no money into the Orlea or anything. They just self-seeded in a raised bed. And I just, you know, would come out here every morning and move them over here. And oh, it's so gorgeous. I love it. I love the lace texture of Orlea. I mean, it's just so beautiful. I feel like I shouldn't even speak. I should just, you know, stand here in awe of its presence. A few sunflowers popping up there and I'm leaving them. I'm really interested to see what kind of sunflowers they are. Um, I do have some things like some hookahs in here from other years, but this is the hydrangea room right here, but we'll go through there on our way back around towards the driveway garden. So let's just continue on this way for now, because I think I tend to miss this area. So I have a lot of catmen here 
And in retrospect, I think I probably should have divided it. Um, I usually divide it every single year and move it around. And this section I didn't divide and it's kind of opening up in the middle. Annabelle hydrangea there with um, some Colorado yarrow in front of it. There's some peonies in here. But here we have Dr. Alexander Fleming. It does seem to flop over, but I think it's a wonderful replacement for Sarah Bernhardt, which, you know, a lot of people talk about Sarah Bernhardt. It just looks like a big, beautiful scoop of strawberry ice cream, doesn't it? So traveling right along here, we get to my big hosta, which was my parents. Some more spiderwort. And then here we are at the new tree that I put in, the Japanese Stewartia. And I see that it's getting some blooms. How exciting. So it's supposed to get white blooms that look almost like a Camilla. So I'm really excited to see that. Ladies mantle looking gorgeous. Don't you love some ladies mantle in your life? <laughs> I love hearing the sound of the bees. I hope the camera is picking that up. Some kind of white jelly here. It's spilled wine, summer wine, one of those. I cut on it so heavily I don't really anticipate it getting full size. Some lamb's ear and then we arrive at this white allium which is not really open yet, just starting to open. I'll put the name on the screen for you. And I have interplanted this love in a mist all around this allium in the hopes that it will kind of, as soon as alliums are done, it'll disguise the foliage. That's my hope at least. Back behind there we have Amsonia. All those bare spots in the garden, you can kind of start to see some gladiolas popping up. This is the one, I think, Isabella. We planted that clematis together the other day. If you remember me planting the Gatsby Gout Oak Leaf Hydrangea, there it is. It was originally in the hydrangea room, but I moved it over here, hoping to kind of do some renovation over here once it gets more mature. And then I have some Annie's Hyssop. All these posts are where I have a dahlia. I think all the posts are diva. So we have diva there just popping up from last year. We arrive, of course, at another limelight because you can never have enough limelights. And let me show you this exciting development, guys. Do you remember how I told you, and I have one thing to tell you about ranunculus that I did as an experiment. I didn't tell you guys about it because I was afraid of what would happen, but it worked and I'm gonna show you that. But these are the ranunculus that I said, I'm gonna stick them in here and I'm gonna completely ignore them. Well, guess what? They're all blooming. <laughs> the plants are not as lush. The blooms are a little bit smaller, but they're still blooming. They started blooming at the same time as the ones in the raised beds. So an interesting uh, experiment there, something to think about. You can see I have some Cerinth Major starting to bloom here. I love the look of Cerinth Major. Gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. Lots of Dara tucked in here, Gara, lots and lots of different plants here. I'm really trying to push the limits on spacing here. Mipira lilies will be blooming probably in about three weeks with a blue shadow father gilla. And then we arrive here at my grandma's chair. I'm actually contemplating not really calling this her garden anymore, but her chair and seeing how that makes me feel about recreating this garden. In a sense, the whole thing is her garden. And maybe just by saying this is all the main flower walk, it will give me a better vision for this area. But we need to do a deep dive back here to see something really gorgeous. Check out the blooms on this mountain laurel. I almost never see at mountain laurels in bloom or at nurseries anywhere. This was here when we moved here. It was originally located um, in the front garden. So I had moved it back here pretty early on. Mine is super, super slow growing, but the blooms are very long lasting in the vase. Although I'm kind of hesitant to cut them after I saw how long it took to rebound. I mean, this is pretty much the size it was when we moved here and I just cut on it a bit and it's still that size, but it's so cool with this cool speckling in the leaves. Ooh, that's a good one. Okay, let me get out of this jungle over here. 
But basically in this area, in my grandma's garden, we're looking, oh, one of the pillows fell off the chair. We're looking at a lot of things that just aren't even up yet. Lots of gladiolas, some are up, some aren't. Lots of super tall lilies in this area. Lots of calla lilies that you can kind of start to see popping up. So it's gonna fill in, but it's gonna be a little later on in the season. So now we arrive here at the raised beds. I've got some really exciting things to share with you as we walk through all of these. So let's just go through in order. Nothing super exciting to see in this bed. This is all my dahlias that get really, really tall and lush. You can see that the sweet peas are starting to do their thing and climb. And the ranunculus have started to bloom and check out these quote unquote peach ranunculus. <laughs> now, I don't know what's going on here, <laughs> but these don't look like peach to me. Do they look like peach to you? They look more like yellow, orange, red, but definitely not peach. So I think that the vast majority of the ones that are supposed to be this beautiful peachy pink, um, they were labeled as salmon. They almost all ended up being red and orange. And I'm not really bothered by that too much, but the thing is I planned other things in my garden to match that peach color. And like, maybe this one is gonna be peach, but there should be 30 peach in here. And I think it's gonna end up being 30 orange and red. But anyway, you know, these things happen. So this one is a Picate and it's a little bit too open. Let me get you another one. Here's Tomer White. Looks like tissue paper, doesn't it? Let me just circle around this bamboo real quick here. So it's interesting about the Picate because they all are a little bit different. Like this is a Picate but it has a lot more hot pink on the top. This is also a Picardy where it's more white with tipped in pink, and this is kind of what I thought they were all gonna look like. But let me give you one more close up on this. I'm gonna put the name on the screen, and if you've grown this variety, and if they are just like this, if it's more of a mix where only some of them are salmon, can you let me know? I really appreciate that. So we're just starting to come into bloom here. And so let's just go through these beds one at a time. This bed here has strawberries. It used to be about that half of this bed was strawberries and I slowly removed them for cut flowers. So here we have some Bupleurum. So this one is uh, starting to branch out here. Let me look at the flower for you here. Really fun on Bupleurum. This whole bed is direct seeded and the back is our Snapdragon cuttings. This is a flower that I really want to grow again, and it's my first time growing it. It's called Saponaria, and I thought it might be a nice replacement for a baby's breath, which I've tried to grow in the past, but never really has perennialized in my garden. And I believe this is a one cut wonder, and I'm not sure if I can do more successions as the kind of heat ramps up. So if you have grown Saponaria, I'm all ears on everything that you would love to share with the group. This is also um, one that I hadn't grown before, but I'd always heard about corn cockle. I think I'm already sure I won't grow it again. Um, it just, I don't know, it's just not doing it for me in terms of foliage. Most of the Snapdragon cuttings I have cut and sold, but here are a few that remain. So the cuttings themselves, they bloom first. And then I'll show you the original plants are about to bloom. Here's my bed of straw flower, and I will net these. Uh, probably should get out the netting today for those. But here are the Snapdragon plants that we took the cuttings from. So these are the pinched plants. And I'll just zoom in on one for as an example, for an example, sorry. So we're getting one, two, three, four stems from that plant. They're butted up now, very exciting. But I have to show you this larkspur. So this is our fall sown larkspur. And it's always hard to get perspective on the camera, but I measured that one that's blooming and it's five foot seven inches tall from the base of the plant. So I'm really excited about that. I think that's the tallest larkspur I've ever grown. They're usually like just maybe hitting me at like neck level, but this one's taller than me. So is this one. 
really, really awesome. I'll be harvesting those with you guys. Here we have our bachelor's button, which I did sew together with you guys in the cool flower video that I did. So these will live here for about a month, maybe a month and a half. Then they kind of just kind of peter out. It gets really hot for them here and I don't have as much use for them, but they're a great early season filler flower and a true blue. And then right in front of those bachelor buttons, I have my rocket snaps, which are white. And they're starting to bud up here. So before we go to the next four raised beds, let me show you the view back here from these lounge chairs. This is sometimes where I sit in the morning, although you know how it goes with gardening. You sit for about two seconds and then you realize all the things that need to get done. But I wanted to show you that because I don't think I've ever showed you that before. So here's where we were and now we'll move on to these raised beds. This one has my anemones and my scabiosa in it. Uh, Oxford blue scabiosa is what's growing there. Randomly lost one plant. I'm not sure what happened there. This one is called Decon sylphid and oh, so beautiful. I don't know if I fell out of love with anemones and now I'm falling back in love with them. This one, the name I'm almost afraid to say out loud, I think it's Decon Foker, or it might be pronounced a different way, F-O-K-K-E-R on that one. But I've been cutting really heavily from this, so definitely just seeing what remains there. So there's that Scabiosa. And then over here is where I have uh, Sunflower Steve's Van Gogh Sunflowers that I'm really excited about. I, for the first time ever on this property, had to order in soil and I was really <laughs> insanely disappointed with the quality of the soil. I'm a little bit concerned um, about the sunflowers. So I actually have another tray started just in case anything goes wrong. What I decided to do just to kind of aerate the soil a bit and help me out with good bugs back here is sow in a whole bunch of dill underneath. I also sewed in some nasturtiums. These are like the rose colored nasturtiums from Baker Creek. I thought those were really pretty, but this whole bed is his sunflowers. And once again, I lost one plant from here too. Isn't it funny when that happens? You like grow a whole area and you lose one. Now we're getting into my vegetable area. So I have just lots of different tomatoes, basil, onions, and this bed. I had some watermelon seeds that my mom gave me. They were from 2004. So I decided to uh, stick them in this mound here and see if they would come up. So we'll see. I'm seeing more like weeds and actually tomatoes. So this bed has mostly my compost in it and it's so much better. I completely regret purchasing that soil. It's so hard to buy soil, isn't it? So let me show you the front of this. So basically just more nasturtiums in the front of this bed and a lot of different peppers. Now this kind of corner stays shady. So I seeded in some lettuce and what else? I think just some radishes. So, but this is the back end of the raised beds. And there's Gracie wanting to say good morning and hello to you all. She hopes you're having a fabulous day, right Grace? So that's the look from back here. And now we're kind of coming to the back corner of the property where I have the $5 garden. And this is my second sunflower succession. This is cherry rose sunflower in the back. Then we have a layer of limelight prime hydrangeas, Foxy foxglove starting to elongate and get its bloom stalks. And then I have Baneri pink and purple zinnias up here. And you can see where Grace likes to visit the neighbor right there and right there. I keep losing zinnias, so I keep throwing some more seed in. But as soon as these sunflowers bloom, I'll definitely show you guys this garden again. I'm calling this the $5 garden just because it basically cost me less than $5 to create it completely from seed. We decided to take those fence panels that weren't working so well and hide the compost pile with them. And my husband did a great job with that. And thank you so much to whoever gave me um, construction advice on the fence. I'm actually gonna give it a try again using your advice. So thanks for that. 
Back here is where I have my corn. I love to grow incredible corn. I haven't grown it in a few years. I grew a ton at work and you can see it just starting to pop up there. But this is the back corner of the property. And I planted these arbor, sorry, <laughs> I'm losing my words now. I planted these arborvitae pretty much right when we moved in. So this is the back corner and there's a fence behind there that my husband put in. But if I turn us this direction, you can see our pear tree here. You can see my husband where he likes to park his truck. And then if we walk down this way, we'll walk through Grace's garden and through the hydrangea room and then back out to the driveway garden. The Coosa dogwood has started to bloom and I just love the Coosa dogwood. I love all the trees here. I'm so thankful to the gentleman that planted them. Um, all the trees that you see over here, he planted. I didn't plant these ones. Whereas the ones that we saw earlier on, I did plant those ones. So Grace's Garden, if you've never joined us before for a garden tour, it's um, full shade over here. Lots of fruit trees, so it has to kind of be stuff I can step on and around. So lots of different hostas. Sun King Aurelia here and there. And then I've just kind of tucked in and divided some lamium in here. Some astilbe starting to bud up. This is where I have all my white astilbe. And we have lots of, <laughs> what are you doing, Grace? We have lots of blue hydrangeas in here and I've ordered three more blue hydrangeas for this area. These two trees here, and it might be hard to see with the sun, are my tart cherry trees. Another apple there in the distance is that trunk. And then as I turn us towards the hydrangea garden and hummingbird way, this is also another apple here. So hopefully the sun will help us out for a few minutes and we can see what's going on here in the hydrangea room. So Grace's garden continues all the way to the fence and it's just kind of all the same plants. Hostas, blue hydrangeas, your mop head microphylla hydrangeas, and lamium, a little bit of sedum tucked in there. Probably I just had some around from divisions and also that Sun King Aurelia. And then there's Grace, living her best life, right? <laughs> Actually, I'm living my best life since I have her. There is kind of some infrastructure back here, the Dyna Trap and a rain barrel. So here we are at the hydrangea room. Actually, let me show you this other angle. I think I like seeing it from this angle the best. I'm really so thankful for the addition of these arbors. It's really brought so much structure to the garden and kind of an instant room by adding walls and a ceiling. And I don't know, it just, the vision came to life. You know, my grandma's garden, I'm still struggling with the vision for that, but I feel like I can see this five years from now. And you know, why is that? Why does sometimes it come together real quickly and it just materializes? I'm not sure why sometimes it works out so good and sometimes it takes a long time. But here you can see some of the apples. And just in case this is your first time watching my channel, this area of the hydrangea room has been here for about four years, and this area is brand new. So that's why you'll see such um, a vast difference in heights. As soon as the hydrangea room comes into bloom, I'm gonna do a tour for you guys, probably mid-June, for all these smooth hydrangeas. So I just have all different smooth hydrangeas and whites, pinks, some lace hydrangeas. I have more pink lace hydrangeas coming from Proven Winners that I'm super, super excited about. Here are the star flower that we started inside together from the seeds that I saved from last year. So you can see, I mean, they're pretty much the same size as the other ones. And maybe they're just a little bit weaker because they do get morning shade. That could just be it. Oh, look at this exciting development. I see one of my poppies starting to elongate. That's exciting. Variegated Jacob's Ladder in here, trying to repeat those anemones there. I'm not sure how the sun is for you guys this morning. So let's walk through Hummingbird Way. Um, there's a lot of lilies in here yet to kind of bloom. This is where I'm having an issue with the four line plant bug taking out some of my larkspur. And let me show you the really serious damage they can do. So you see this larkspur here? That got hit by four line plant bug probably before they even reached adulthood, kind of when they're a red color earlier on in their life cycle. And you can see it's just completely ruined. I might as well just pull it out. 
but some of them have been untouched. So we'll just see. You know, last year I chose not to do anything. It turned out okay in the end. Um, I don't know, send me, send me any at all, and all advice on that. Some irises that are pretty much going over now. And I cut a whole bunch, well, not a whole bunch, but I cut the irises that remained over here, the concertina ones. I have my lisianthus tucked in there, gladiolas on each side, kind of mirroring each other. I think we're gonna have to wait at least another month for this area to fully make sense, just because I have so many seedlings in here. Like I have a whole bunch of fever few over on this side. I have also the fever few on this side, but also I have Celosia over here, um, some more Larkspur, that Peruvian lily's just starting to come up. So I'm seeing a lot of bare ground here and uh, it'll take a little bit more time for that to get covered up. But I think we've seen most of what the backyard has to offer. So let's head back to the front gate and I want to show you my ranunculus experiment that I didn't tell you I was doing up in the front. And then we'll move through a small section of the front garden where I have some roses in bloom. And then onto the driveway garden. I'll explain my experiment back here quickly because it's much quieter back here. Basically in mid-February when I soaked my ranunculus corms, I took two large handfuls and instead of pre-sprouting them, I planted them in a container in my front garden. I watered them in and then I completely neglected them. I did not pay one single ounce of attention to them just to see what's the difference in the plant's vigor, the plant health, how many flowering stems I'm gonna get from each plant. And so now let's see those results. So basically all of my front and side gardens are pretty much the same. They're all hydrangeas, rhododendrons, red and orange lilies, which are just starting to pop back up hostas, ferns, and gladiolas. But there's not too much to see right now since those bulbs and hydrangeas aren't in bloom. But here's the box with those ranunculus. I planted at least 25 corms into this long, large planter that I had out here. And you know, they just went right from the bucket to this planter here. About five ranunculus plants actually came up I would say three are moderately thriving and three have decided to put on bloom stalks thus far. And we'll just keep tracking them. But I just wanted to try this experiment because I did notice some people were asking, especially in an article that I had written about, well, what if I just stick the soaked corms right into the ground at the same time, what will happen? And I had never tried that before. I had always just, I had always just gone through the pre-sprouting process. So here's a look at what happened for me this year when I did that. So let me know if you've ever tried that with ranunculus corms and what the results have been. But now let's head over to the driveway garden and see how things are looking over there. And I did love the suggestion of calling this area the avenue. The street that my grandma lived on was originally called North Lawn Drive. Then they changed it for some reason to North Lawn Circle. So I kind of had contemplated calling this North Lawn Circle, but what I'm going for over here is a park feel with tons and tons of flowers for cutting. So really a 100% cutting garden over here, everything grown for the purpose of cutting, but set up more like a park, if that makes sense. I don't know, maybe that's a weird idea, but I thought it would be fun. So let's walk through the pathway here. And I do have a pretty serious lull in terms of blooms over here. It was beautiful with lots of peonies and iris, but now we're waiting on all these lilies. So lots of Asiatic lilies here and also my rose lilies. If I turn us this way, we have a new nine bark that I put in last fall. And this is where I have my pink astilbe. It's just starting to get going and I put this area in as bare root plants last year and now they've really taken off. I really love to buy bare root perennials. I think they get established a little bit easier or quicker rather than ones you buy in containers, but that's just my opinion. Now you see my third succession of sunflowers here and this little bench which is getting swamped by a weeping redbud and a limelight hydrangea. Lots more lilies and a beautiful viburnum here. 
I want to focus on this shrub because I feel like it doesn't get mentioned almost ever and it's a great shrub for cutting and I have failed to mention it. This one right here is called Kodiak Black Dervella. There's also an orange version and my mom has that one but this foliage lasts a really really long time in the vase. Nice strong stems. It does get kind of a yellow flower. I never even wait to bother to see that because I just cut on it really really heavily. So great foliage if you need some this time of year. So you see back here in this area, I have not cut the grass. That's where I have my naturalized daffodils. I sowed the wildflower mix in there and also I added in a lot of cosmos and I have another flat of cosmos and another flat of amimagus that I'm going to be sticking in this area. And this is where I have my two-year-old foxy fox glove and they're looking great. I have cut a lot of them for arrangements. But what I really want to show you, in case you didn't see it last year, and I added a bit more, is this fabulous allium called Schubertii. And last year I described it as living fireworks in the garden, and I can't think of another or a better way to describe them because that's just what they look like. They just look like floral explosions in the garden. They're really short for an allium but they dry really well. You can spray paint them and put them on your Christmas tree. That's how I first heard about them because um, Sarah Raven mentioned on a program I was watching a few years back that that's what she did with hers. But they're just so much fun. And look at them. I even have them popping up through the catmint. Let me show you this one. And it's almost like you miss them at first and you have to be walking slowly and carefully to see them. It's interesting how they're so big, but you can miss them if you're not looking close enough. So the tree we have here that I absolutely love is another Kusa dogwood. And let's swing around to the other side. So I really need to do some work over here, especially on this side. I really don't like to see this big of a lull at any time in the year in terms of flowering, but I'm basically waiting on all my Colorado yarrow to bloom. Some of it has started to bloom and I have been cutting on this plant, but isn't that beautiful? And this is its second year in the ground, this Colorado yarrow, and it is really starting to take over. I may have to divide that or rethink the placement on that, but there were all these beautiful tulips in here. And my main plan for what I'm gonna be adding to this area this year, is I'm going to be adding in three ginger wine nine bark just to bring in some differing foliage color over here. I want to stick a little bit more in the pink red zone over here. That's the color of my lilies are pinks, reds, whites. Uh, I think I have one peach lily over here. But this area is definitely a work in progress. This garden is only about two years old, but it will be really exciting to watch this area grow. And if you've never seen this when the lilies are in bloom, I hope you'll come back and join us again for another tour because really it's a night and day situation over here. Well, friends, I think that brings us to the end of the May Garden Tour. I think I might've missed a few things here and there, but hopefully I'll catch you up in a vlog sometime soon. As always, I wanna thank you so much for watching these garden tours. Your friendship really just means so much to me and it's just such a joy here in the May garden, isn't it? Everything is so fresh, filled with new life and there's so much joy in anticipating what's to come, isn't there? <laughs> there's something about putting that seed into the earth waiting patiently, watching it each day until it finally just explodes into bloom. And here we are at the beginning of May. Things are already starting to fill up, but there's still so much more to come. So I wanna wish you a wonderful day out in your gardens. Thanks so much for spending some time with me, Buddy, Rocky, Harry, who you don't see too often, and Grace, and I'll see you sometime soon. Bye.